That way I'll be able to look at the parts I miss. All there right. Recording in progress. Thank you all for coming tonight. Hope you enjoy the presentation. And uh, I'll be checking back in with you. And Carl, if we have any problems, I don't think we will. Uh, you can call me on the other number. Okay. Got it. All right. Thanks Appreciate it. Thanks, Russ. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> well, I am super excited for tonight's presentation. I had asked uh, Frank to tag team this with me. Uh, I've been doing some uh, pinhole photography, but I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and so I thought, let's get somebody who has some experience, who could give us some background, some details, some depth, uh, and you'll kind of set the stage. And then I'll, I'll be, I'll do the, I'll do the, you know, you'll get the meat from Frank and then I'll do the, the icing and the flash on top. So Frank, uh, you don't need any introduction, uh, a legend in his time a uh one of the re you know one of the main reasons i joined the camera club was that i could get to know frank and learn from him and i've been uh, very grateful for that opportunity so frank uh you can you got it you're ready to go so take it away thank you very much i appreciate that bruce i'm doing some housekeeping here some uh puppy housekeeping As long as 40,000 years ago, pre-human Neanderthals were leaving their marks in cave paintings. And I forgot to ask the question, what the heck is a pinhole camera? <laughs> and why should I care? Well, that's the title of my, my part of this evening's festivities. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. We all use modern lenses that are wonderful tools. They give us a lot. They give us excellent image quality, amazing autofocus, the ability to choose the point of sharp focus and the depth of field that we want. Some even zoom through impressive ranges from wide angle to telephoto. Others can reveal tiny details, not visible to the naked eye. But how do they work? First, a little history. As long as 40,000 years ago, pre-human Neanderthals were leaving their marks in cave paintings. Many of these were as simple as geometric figures, while others depict animals such as early ancestors of pigs and horses with an accuracy suggesting that their makers used more information than just memory in their artwork, that images of their subjects could have been projected from bright outdoors into the dark walls of their caves. We know from the observations of Chinese scholars as far back as a thousand years BC, and from Aristotle and Euclid, and from Anthemius of Trollus, 6th century co-architect of the Church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. I know some of you have visited this marvelous structure. Its co-architect was fascinated with light. He and the others I mentioned discovered that light rays travel in straight lines, and in doing so, they carry information about the source of their transmission or about objects from which they were reflected. This is one of Anthemius's diagrams about light. And no, there will not be a quiz. The concept that you need to understand in order to, to get in with penhole photography is the camera obscura. It's the Latin term that means simply dark chamber. Now, many of us carry dark chambers around with us pretty much all the time. It's another word for a camera. The camera is basically a box that can be made dark inside, and inside there lives film or a digital sensor, and it'll have some kind of image forming part, nowadays typically a lens, but the earliest of these cameras obscura 
used not lenses, but tiny holes. And they were probably discovered, much like the cave painters discovered, when light was observed coming through uh, tiny chinks or holes, perhaps around windows, uh, and forming images inside the dark room of what was going on outdoors. Curiously, these images were upside down and backward, as the one that you see here of Brunelleschi's magnificent Duomo in Florence, Italy. And this woodcut is uh, an artist drawing a reproduction of the Duomo from uh, the image cast by his pinhole into his camera obscura or dark chamber. By the way, we can experience a great camera obscura here in the Inland Empire, the California Museum of Photography in Riverside, which is just about due to open up again, has a camera obscura on the third floor. You can go inside and see an image of the plaza outside projected onto the walls, upside down and backward, of course. Let's take a look at how light rays form an image. Here we have a subject, nothing particularly dramatic about him, but we're going to be looking at how light is reflected from the subject from just a couple of points, the tip of his coat and from the tip of his pipe. Now we're choosing just a couple of points because if we showed all of the reflections off the subject, uh, we'd have nothing but a mess of arrows. Looking over on the right at uh, what represents a focal plane where film or a digital sensor lives inside a dark box or dark chamber or camera obscura or just simply these days a camera, we can see that no coherent image is formed because the light rays are just flowing in all directions. If, on the other hand, we put something in the way to obstruct the light rays, something that has a hole in it, in this case, we're going to use a largish hole, then only some of the light rays will pass through the hole and onto the uh, surface behind, whether that surface is a wall, whether it's the inside of a camera or whatever. And notice that an upside down and backward image of the subject is formed, but also notice that corresponding to the large hole, we have a rather coarse or crude image. It's kind of hard to tell what it is. If we replace that large hole with a smaller hole, we'll get a finer or higher resolution image, although it's still nothing to write home about. And yet, this is the way image formation happens, whether it's through a pinhole or whether it's through something more complicated. Again, the difference between a large hole and a small hole. <laughs> if we were to use a lens, we would have a much sharper image and a brighter image, but we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. Let's look at some fun facts about pinholes. A smaller pinhole equals higher resolution. But if we make the pinhole size really small, diffraction rears its ugly head. And as you all may remember hearing me say more than once, diffraction is real. Diffraction is something that uh, impacts overall image quality. And it happens when we pass the light through too small a hole, whether that's a pinhole or whether it's the aperture of a lens. So when we're using a lens with a variable aperture, you don't want to make that aperture too small because diffraction will bite you in the butt every time. We can adjust the distance from the pinhole to the focal plane, which is where the film or digital sensor lives. And in doing so, we vary the focal length. If you put the 
focal plane close to the pinhole, you get a wide angle. If you put the focal plane farther away from the pinhole, you get a telephoto effect. Depth of field with a pinhole image is nearly unlimited, although nothing is seriously sharp. You can make a pinhole for your digital camera using a camera body cap. The way to do that is to drill a hole in the camera body cap, maybe a quarter of an inch in diameter, and then take a piece of foil and tape it over the hole that you just drilled and use a, a small needle, pierce the foil to make the pinhole. And you can experiment with different size pinholes. And if you have uh, any kind of, of close-up adapter rings, you can vary the spacing between the body cap pinhole and the body itself to make your lens more wide angle or more telephoto in the way I described earlier. So you can make your own pinhole digital camera, which has a lot of advantages over, over film pinhole cameras, which like many of you, I suspect, I enjoyed uh, experimenting with when I was younger. But we have uh, a, an expert experimenter among us who is going to tell us how he has used pinhole photography in a modern context. And I can hardly wait. Bruce Herwig, take it away. Thank you, Frank. That is fascinating. I had no idea that it went back so far. That is incredible. Thousands of years. I, I thought it was a, just a more of a modern uh, opportunity. All right, let's see. I'm going to share my screen and I'll share the sound. And let's see, you tell me if you can see my screen. Yes, indeed. Okay. Lots of star pictures. Yeah, well, I've got to go backwards. There we go. Ta-ta. All right, silography. So uh, many of you know, uh, know me, my, my likes of shooting the night sky. And I do long exposure photography uh, with the Milky Way. Uh, this was out in Nevada. And the you know, long exposure uh, for me is two minutes. Now I'm using my, you know, it used to be 30 seconds. Uh, now I was doing, uh, I've got my tracker. So I'm doing three minutes or four minutes of track shots. Uh, Russ and I went up to the Torona Pinnacles. Um, this was much shorter, 30 seconds. Um, but I was, you know, one of the things that you start shooting with uh, when you're shooting in the night sky is star trails. And star trails show the movement. You start seeing movement. And I love that idea of capturing movement using long exposure photography. So that was, uh, this was one of my first star trails I ever did. This was a couple of years later, starting to get a little bit fancier. This image here uh, was taken in March. This is actually an eight hour star trail picture and wow. was just, uh, it made the top five in the, I'm a finalist right now in the Joshua, Joshua Tree National Park photo contest. Um, and if I win, the picture will go on the little uh, annual pass card, which is cool. But again, uh -huh. you can definitely see the, the, the passage of time. And so moons, uh, you could do the same thing. How do you convey movement and passage of time? This was an eclipse a few years ago. So showing multiple images. Uh, this was a composite that I had done. Uh, I'm, I'm ashamed looking back at it. I didn't even get the, the movement of the moon right or accurate uh, in terms of its movement, but trying to just show, move, uh, show time. This was an eclipse. Uh, the, the angle of the... Uh, of the moon here is way off. It really actually went almost straight up in the air. But you've got you've got passage of time. You've got movement. This was uh, something I had tried a couple uh, actually last year. Looking over the San Bernardino Mountains, I called this string of pearls. So this was the moon every four minutes across, composited in with the night shot, uh, morning sunset, threw in some stars. And a, and a starburst there. It's actually a moonburst 
Uh, but again, how do you show time? So I can show time with the Milky Way. I could show time with, uh, with the stars. I could show time with the moon, but how do you do the sun? And I was really, I was scratching my head. How do I show the movement of the sun? And uh, my friends over at Save Like Live Oak Canyon, uh, they're, they're with the Nature Conservancy and they, they're trying to save, the, save the, uh, this area. And uh, you've got the summer solstices. So when I, I, you know, I'm very interested in sunrise, moonrise, anything to do with anything rising in the sky. And so in the summertime, in fact, I was just there on Sunday with the summer solstice rising between Mount San Bernardino and Mount San Gregorio, right in that little notch. It's, it's a little, little crevice, it's a little notch. And in winter, uh, it rises on the other side. This was a, a panorama I took with my uh, uh, smartphone. And so San Jacinto, it, it actually rises over there and I've got a close up here. But this is a very special place. Uh, there was actually in the 1930s, somebody flew over and took an aerial photograph of a petroglyph that was, uh, that was taken, that was right here in Redlands. Since then it's been disappeared. This was a series of petroglyphs that the Native Americans had done. Uh, there's one in Blight, there's several here in, in uh, Southern California. And actually, if you look up, if you drive up Yucaipa on the left-hand side, you'll see this uh, amoeba looking um, picture on the side of the wall. So Yucaipa acknowledges it, Redlands uh, says they know nothing uh, about it, but at this special spot, you can see both of the uh, sunrises for the, uh, the winter solstice and the summer solstice. <clears throat> So here's the, again, the summer solstice uh, rising right there in the notch. Here is the winter solstice uh, coming up right there in San Jacinto. So I was uh, looking at petapixel.com. This is one of the websites I, I subscribe to, it's in my feed. And somebody was showing a picture of this solograph and it was done in Antarctica. And I thought, this is great. This is how the sun travels across the sky. In the winter time, you have a short amount of light. And so that's, you see the lower arc and the bottom. And in uh, later in the year, it goes much higher. You have longer time. It takes longer to travel across the sky. And I go, this is fantastic. I finally have a name for what it is I'm trying to do, a solar graph. So I start searching on the internet. How do you make a solar graph? Um, and this was one of the, the pictures. They, they just stuck it to the side of the wall. It's like, oh, this is fantastic. So I looked up sol solography and uh, was looking online and uh, found this image. And they, they show you how to make it. Well, first off, you have to have a, a, a can of some sort, a beer can, a Red Bull can, uh, some sort of can. And you have this knife. And then you have a special pin tool that you poke a hole in it. And I go, oh, that makes sense. You got, it's a pinhole camera. You probably use a pin to poke the hole. That made sense. And then you had to have this special paper. And it's like, oh, I don't have any paper. Then you have to stick it in. This is the one that really got me though. I go, look at the sharp edges on that. Like I will cut myself for sure. There's no way I'm getting involved in this, but it's a neat idea. And if you look at these, you put the tape on them, and then I go, these things are, ugly. these are butt ugly. These <laughs> just would not be happy to be associated with anything that looks this ugly. Uh, so there's gotta be a better way. So I went back, um, looked at the camera or looked back at the article and I saw, I looked sideways, those solar can, those solar can, somebody made this already. They already went through the process of doing this. So I looked up Solar Can, and it's actually a, a website. Uh, the guy made a website. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen. Well, I, maybe I could just move over. I'm going to try to jump over to here. <clears throat> Can you see my um, 
can you see did it shift over to a website nope so i'm gonna so i must have been just sharing my powerpoint so i'm gonna share my screen of this one and i'm gonna share the sound and we're gonna play just a, a little minute video let the inventor of the solar can explain what it is it's a very interesting character to my first ever kickstarter where i'd like to talk to you about solar can a fully functional extreme time exposure camera capable of capturing the path of the sun through the day sky confused well with solar can people of all ages and abilities will be able to create unique images like this or this or this let me explain to you how the solar can works. When it first arrives, getting started couldn't be easier. Just look for a nice spot to place it outside or a sun facing window inside and make sure it's secure, then remove the black tab. Immediately, light will be able to pass through the pinhole and begin exposing an image on the photographic paper inside. The minimum exposure time is around a week However, bear in mind that the longer you leave it, the more impressive the sun's path will look. During the summer, the sun is higher in the sky, whereas in the winter, much lower. When your time is up or you simply run out of patience, remove your solar can and bring it indoors to reveal the photograph that you have captured. Using a standard tin opener, remove the solar can lid and retrieve the photographic paper inside. Finally, take a digital picture of your image using your phone camera or computer scanner and invert the colours using a free photo editing app. Your masterpiece will then be created. But first we need your help. The pro <laughs> Interesting character. Uh, but I, got, I was just so excited because I finally uh, could see uh, I had a way to now make these things, make these uh, solography images, and uh, without having to uh, cut myself <laughs> or, uh, or know anything about the photo paper or anything of that nature. So I was super excited, like, Eureka, I found it. And so I immediately went uh, on to uh, just check it. You can see my, um, see my screen as I'm sharing again. I can't hear anybody. Yes, I'm sharing. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. So the images from these solar cans are fantastic. Uh, if you go to their website, this is exactly what I was looking to do is capture the full from solstice to solstice to capture no batteries, no, uh, no muss, no fuss, no chemicals. Uh, super easy to do and uh, get a result. And so it's like, oh, look, you can then photo manipulate. It's like, I know how to use Photoshop. So this is good. I can do that. And I was just so impressed with these images. So again, winter solstice, low arch, summer solstice, high arch. And all these places in the between, you could see where they had clouds coming through. And that would block the light coming through. And that's that's what would happen during um, during the time, and that's why you get these bands across there. It's like, oh, this is just gorgeous. I want one of these things. Six months of photography. So I bought the uh, the five pack. So five pack for sixty pounds, or it's about eighty five dollars U.S. And they come in a super cool uh, packaging. They come with the zip ties. Uh, the colors don't mean anything special. The, all the cans are silver inside. Uh, so I was, I was, it was about to be <laughs> the solstice. So I needed to have these things rushed. Um, so I get my solar cans. I'm super excited. And I, you know, there's the read the instructions kind of people. And then there's the not read the instructions kind of people. And I thought, well, I would at least skim the instructions. So opened up, find a suitable location facing the sun with a good view of the sky horizon. It's like, great, I know exactly where I want to be. Step two, seek permission for the location. It's like, oh, that's a good, 
that's probably a good idea. Not everybody is excited about seeing a silver can attached to a public location, especially after 9-11. Uh, anything, you know, you see something, say something, and it's like, oh boy, I better, uh, I better work on that part about getting permission. Um, and then again, look at solstices. Uh, so I knew exactly when I was going to put it on and use the cable ties. It's like, okay, so far, so good. I can do all these things. Uh, the cable ties, again, they come with it. It's like, how simple can this be? So I'm even more excited now that I've read the instructions to put one of these things in action. But I remember they said, get permission. So I'm at the end of, so Live Oak Canyon, you can see is on the right. The community is on the left. I'm at Freya Drive. Freya Drive is exactly where the uh, petroglyph was. In fact, I'm going to zoom in and put an overlay here. You can see the path wandering through perfectly. Right at the end of the cul-de-sac is exactly where this petroglyph is supposedly supposed to have been. From this location, from this, uh, from this cul-de-sac, you can see, uh, like I showed you before, <clears throat> winter solstice and the summer solstice. So I had uh, was given, there was three neighbors here, neighbor one, neighbor two, and neighbor three. Neighbor one was part of the conservancy. So they uh, knew this was gonna be a friendly person, but I wasn't exactly sure where to place it, where I could get permission. So I called neighbor one and I couldn't get a hold of them. So, uh, so I'm going to go knock on their door. So I drive down and neighbor one was not home. So I couldn't get him on the phone, couldn't see him, but I could tell immediately, uh, you can't see it from the satellite images, but there's trees all over the place. This would not be a place where I would have clear view of the solstices. So that I knew that that wasn't gonna work. Neighbor number two was mowing his lawn. So I walk on over, excuse me, neighbor, I'm looking to do this uh, solar experiment. I had my uh, sample images. This is what it might look like. Uh, I was explaining my, and I got a definitive, no, sir, you may not put any sort of, of uh, camera or any other recording device on my property no way, no how. Like, okay, well, that leaves me with neighbor number three. Why well, go to neighbor number three? They're not home either. So I was like, okay, I'm stuck now. So I get a call back from neighbor number one. I say, neighbor number one, you're next door neighbor number two. He wouldn't let me in. Uh, he won't let me put it up. Do you have an idea? They go, yeah. Neighbor number three is going to be on the East Coast for six months. They won't mind. Go use their backyard. <laughs> it's like, okay. Well, I'm going to ask, ask uh, better ask for forgiveness than ask permission. And I, the neighbor gave me permission. So I was like, okay, I'll use neighbor number three's yard. So I went to neighbor number three's yard. First time I went over there, I wasn't sure. Did they have an alarm? Did they have pit bull in the backyard? I don't know what's going on. So I'm sneaking in the backyard. Didn't see a place in their backyard to put it, but noticed that they had a location to get into the field because this is all uh, blocked up here. And so I could get into the fields like, oh, there's a perfect spot for it. There's a nice pole here. I could uh, tie zip tie it to the pole. So that's what, so I had my, I knew my location. I had my plan. So I was gonna do an install on the summer solstice on June 20th, 2020. And I was going to pick it up six months later. So I got my location. I have my, uh, my plan. I have my solar cans. I am ready to go. So neighbor number one or neighbor number two here, you can see the backyard fence. And there, there was a nice little location. I just put my cans on there. And so I then put a little instructions. Okay, permission, don't remove. Here's my number. If you have any questions, call me. And neighbor number two, right next to his house, there was another fence. So this was, uh, I put my second solar can over here. And I, so I would drive by it every month or so just to make sure they were still there. And uh, six months later goes by, goes by faster than you think. The older I get, it seems to go by even faster. Six months goes by and I'm picking up my can. And you can see on the left-hand side, 
you can see uh, the, the, the little tiny pinhole. From what the can says, this is a F-132. Uh, it's, it's not 164, like the 64 club, but it's 132. of a, That's what the aperture is on there. So I can't imagine half of that, but that's what, uh, that's what it is. And so using the zip ties, I used a little scissor uh, knife thing and I, I cut the zip ties. And I could tell these things had been out in the California sun. They were so brittle, they just popped right off. It was, uh, I knew that the next time I was gonna need a little bit more substantial uh, opportunity. So I got my solar cans and you put the little tab thingy, uh, you store it underneath and you put it back on place so no light gets into it, and messes up your photos while you're driving it back and forth. So I've got my two cans. I got the one on the left, I got the one on the right. And to give it just uh, some size, uh, it's a little bit taller. It's about the same width, but a little bit taller than your traditional um, soda pop can. So just like the, the video said, I got my standard uh, soup can opener. Uh, so can opener, so I, I'm doing my soup can and I'm putting it around the top and then I could see in. It's like, oh, this is the first time opening. It's, this is better than Christmas. First time opening a solar can and I could see here the little tabby things. It's like, oh, that's how they get the paper in there to stay. They put these little, they put the, uh, they put, put paper and it stays put on the tabby things. So I pull it out and this is uh, lay it flat. Right now I have some two books, one on the left, one on the right, holding, holding the paper down. And you get a five by seven piece of paper. And this is what I'm seeing. And I could see I have these arches. So I have a small arch, I have the large arch, and I have all the arches in between. And then I have this line. So it actually was upside down and inverted, just like uh, Frank was saying, I, I turned it right side up. And then I looked at the second, uh, second can, open that one up. But I could tell by looking at the can when I picked it up, something had shifted. I knew it wasn't sitting straight. And when I opened up the can, I could see that something was wrong because there was two line, two thick lines on the right. And so some, some you know, three months in, four months in, uh, something had shifted. And so I knew this, this was a, a bum, a bum deal. So I had to toss that one out. So I inverted the photo and I could see here exactly what I had. I had small, winter, large, summer. And then I was like, what are these things? These rings here, these three rings here were the fires that we had. The apple fire, the Yukaipa fire, and the other fire. That block that was, you know, they, they each lasted a couple of weeks. They blocked the sun enough that you could actually record. What, so this is better than tree rings on uh, but on uh, photography, you could tell what's happening with the weather. And I was just so tickled pink. So I was trying to figure out, okay, how do I show this a little bit better? Uh, because I wanted to go from point to point. And so I put back in the foreground and you could see where the sun rose over here in the San Bernardino mountains right here in the, in the niche. And right over here in San, uh, San Jacinto, and you can see exactly what the it, what uh, this is exactly what you see in real life. But this is shows the path of the sun. And what blew me away was look at the summer solstice. Look how tall this the sun goes. It goes way way higher than I ever would have thought. And that's because of uh, in Antarctica, it's relatively low, but the lower you go closer to the equator, the taller it seems to get. And so that was, uh, that I didn't expect that. And that was, that was pretty cool. So this was my first solar can uh, solography experience, uh, experiment. So let me take a break real, real quick. And what questions uh, might somebody have? Bruce, what's the paper? It obviously is not photographic. 
print paper, but what is it? It is, it's some sort of, you know, Ill, uh, they're, they're, it's light sensitive. And Frank, you may have a better idea about what kinds there are. It's, a, I saw Ilford was a brand name. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, I think, Frank. Uh, let's see. You're, you're muted, Frank. Uh, if you hold the space key, Frank, I think you can unmute yourself. <clears throat> There's different brand. I'm, Frank, you're not, uh, we can't hear you. You're still muted. Maybe you could unmute him, Bruce. It should be on your uh, screen. How now? Uh, oh, there you go. You're good. Okay. Uh, there was, I don't know if it's still being made, but there was a paper called POP, Printing Out Paper. And it was designed for making proofs from negatives back in a, at a time when, when a small negative was four by five. And uh, you would put this into a, what looked like a contact printing frame, a wood frame with a glass cover, and you would expose it to the sun until the image showed up on the paper. Uh, two advantages. One, it required no processing because it the, the image developed in the sunlight, and two, uh, you could give this to some uh, a customer as a proof, and if they expose it to light, it would continue developing or, or printing out, and uh, it would not be any good as a permanent picture. It would only be good short-term as a proof. And uh, I remember as a kid, I found a box of this stuff. I have no idea where it came from, but I really enjoyed playing with it but I didn't know a solar graph from a lawnmower then, or I could have had some of your fun, Bruce. <laughs> well, there are different brands and uh, I've got a couple that I'm seeing, but Ilford made, made a special kind of paper. Uh, there are several different kinds and uh, we'll get into that. I've got some screenshots anyway of some, some uh, potential paper uh, that oh. people have used. Any other questions? On the paper, did it fade after you uh, after you took it out of the can? Did the start, picture start to fade, or is it? No, it's only super bright paper. And in the instructions, it said you don't have to be in a dark room. And that was one of the advantages. It had to be super. You know, the, actually, the the light of as, of the sun is the only thing that would really uh, blank it out. They said actually you could put it on a photocopier or a scanner. And get you had one shot of scanning it, uh, but instead of doing that, I would put it flat. I would tape it to the tape it to the table, and then take a picture with my iPhone, and that did it just fine. And then I would take the finished image, and I would just right now I have them stored in a magazine, you know, because it's totally dark and closed. Uh, so I still have the images, and you can still see uh, still see the lights on them, uh, the the uh, the path of the sun. Bruce, where was the hole on the can for the uh, light coming into the can? The hole on the camera is right in the middle. I'm going to back up a little bit. Okay, right where the tab is, right in the middle where that black tab is. So it's, it's pretty much right in the middle. This allows you to get some foreground and some uh, some sky, about 50-50. Of course, the image is going to be upside down uh, as it's being taken, but it's right in the middle. Now, the images that I wanted, uh, I knew that I wanted, uh, I, I wasn't sure how this was going to work. So the next version that I did, I tilted it at an angle, and we'll see that here in a minute. Any other questions before I continue? All right, let me uh, move forward. So my first image, my first image was a success. Six months, you know, a, a, basically a year in the making, six months in the photography, and uh, I was able to share this with the Conservancy and the Save uh, Save Live Oak Canyon. They've used it as part of their literature now. Uh, it's been incorporated, showing this unique view of the sun going from solstice to solstice. And so I was pretty pumped. 50% of my photos worked. 
one out of two. <laughs> so I was ready to go because you only get two solstices a year. And so I was ready to, uh, to figure out the next place. And so my next um, plan was to do an install at the winter solstice and pick it up on Sunday. So my office is closed. So I got, got special permission. I work at the Xerox building in San Bernardino off hospitality. And I knew I wanted to get higher uh, and a different view. I wanted to have a clear view facing south. And so my, this is my office building. Um, and you could see the arrow where I wanted to put it. So I got uh, called up management, showed them my first success picture, said, this is what I'm looking to do. There's no batteries. You can't record people. This isn't surveillance. This is science and art. Uh, would you be interested in partnering with me in this project? And they said, yes. So they got me per special permission to go upstairs to the sixth store of the building. So I'm climbing with all my gear up, <laughs> up the ladder to see what I could see and uh, found a spot. I, I knew that I could put it to a pole. So I found a pole with an unobstructed view facing south. And this time, rather than using the zip ties, I went a little bit beefier. I went to Home Depot. I found something that I could uh, tip the can at an angle. I used, uh, instead of just plastic zip ties, they used metal uh, ties that I could use, use a screw. Uh, but what I had experienced before, when I go metal on metal, the, the ties would, would just slide up and it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hold. So I found a plastic material that was actually, a, you know, that you put on the bottom of drawers uh, and I got some special tape and I taped that, I wrapped that around. And so that gave a little bit of uh, friction on there and uh, then zipped, uh, used the, the metal zip ties. And then you wait six months. And that's a long six months. Um, what I didn't realize in that six months is that the, uh, when, I, when I had first installed it, it was cold, it was winter, but the boiler is about 10 feet away from where this is at. Yeah, in fact, you can see over here on the left-hand side picture that, that big stove looking thing, that uh, chimney looking thing, that's the boiler. And so all kinds of moisture would be coming out of that. And I'm thinking, okay, well maybe the moisture is gonna beat up and hide, you know, put on that little, uh, that dot of a, that little pinhole and it's gonna cover it up and it's gonna mess it up. Or maybe all kinds of moisture is gonna get inside and I'm gonna have a moldy picture. I was kind of nervous. Maybe, uh, you know, the, the Santa Anas are going to come and knock this thing down. So it was a nerve wracking six months. So I don't have access to the building on the weekend. So Friday, I picked it up. So I go back up the building. So I climb up the stairs, go to the roof of the building. And I was relieved. Everything was still there. Nothing had moved. The tape, the glue, the stickers, the <laughs> All the adhesives, everything was in place. So this was a positive sign. I was very excited about seeing uh, what I might get uh, from this opportunity. And you can see this is the bottom of the can and that's where you hide the tab. So for six months, that little tab's been sticking on the bottom. So you take the tab and you put it back on top. So you cover it. So while you're moving it, you don't uh, expose the paper. So I get my, my, uh, my screwdriver out and now I'm unscrewing this thing. And on the right-hand side, success. I took it out, you know, leave no trace, took all my gear back with me down the stairs. <clears throat> that was Friday morning. Now I, I am, this is like, again, I'm a kid in the candy store. It's Christmas time. I know what I shot, but I had no clue what I got. <laughs> and so I can't wait. Uh, but I, we had uh, family obligations in the evening, so it's Saturday. Finally get a chance to open this thing. I get my uh, handy-dandy can opener back open. You know the drill. Get the can opener. Look inside. You can see the little tabby thing. So the paper's there. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm peeking inside. You know, can I see anything? Can I see anything? Uh, there's a much better view of, the, of how, it, how it's held in there. So this... The, the, the people who put together these solar cans, I'm just so impressive. I'm so impressed at the, the care and the, um, 
you know, how, you know, these things are designed for success. So rolling the paper out and I lay it flat and boom, booyah, I've got something. I've got a low arch and I've got a high arch and I'm facing straight south and I almost nailed it right in the middle, right exactly in the middle. So I am super, I was super pumped to see that I had uh, this. And you can see that it's upside down. If you look on the bottom left and right, you can see the white, the white sheet of the paper and that's where those little tabs are holding it. So it was upside down and backwards. And so I knew I had to uh, reverse that over here. And I did the same thing, uh, put the foreground back in and you can see lower in the winter, higher uh, summertime, super high going across. And right over here where the mouse is, I'm not sure, can you see my mouse? Yep, uh, right over here, this is the Loma Linda Hospital. And uh, this, you could tell we had some weather here. So this would have been Jan uh, this would have been uh, January or early late December. This would have been January and here that's when that's when we had some weather, some clouds. And so that made sense. So more weather, more clouds, but less, 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 you know, no clouds pretty whatsoever to block this thing. And so again, I had a successful uh, experience capturing it. So it's been one year now. You get two solstices. What's gonna, <laughs> what's gonna happen next? So I had a plan with Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, Dr. Watson, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll get to that here. But in the meantime, I have found this guy from Poland. His name is Marcin Lilla. He's from Poland. This is a link to his, uh, his page. And he builds these things from scratch. He doesn't use cans. He uses a different process here. But his images are absolutely gorgeous. He gets the whole foreground in there with the sky image in the background. And I just think this is such a unique image. Here's a boat that was sitting at port for a while. You can see the silhouette of the boat. And then you can see uh, the reflection in the water. And then you can see the sun going across. And uh, so Poland, so he's a little bit higher than we are latitude wise. And so the, uh, from solstice to solstice, it doesn't go as high as we are. Higher you go north, the flatter it gets. Closer to the equator, the taller it gets. Here's another over a bridge. And it's, this is very similar to nightscape images. First, you get the technique down where you get the sky right, and then all of a sudden you're interested in putting foregrounds in front of it. And that's exactly what I'm seeing him do. He's nailed the sky, now he's putting interesting foregrounds in it. But I'm wondering how the heck does he do this? Well, he also puts together calendars, and uh, I'm a calendar guy myself, so I had an e uh, interest, uh, equal affinity, just beautiful images. This, he makes his own. He uses a PVC pipe for the backing, and then he uses special Ilford paper uh, to, to go inside of it. And then he uses lots and lots of electrical tape <laughs> to put these things. And he doesn't just make one or two. He is not satisfied with just one or two. He made <laughs> like 30, 50. He made like all different sizes, different shapes. And so this guy is one dedicated dude. And where does he put them? He puts them all over town. And so any place that he can put them, he can disguise them. Uh, he sticks them way, you know, gets a ladder, comes at night, sticks them in, in these uh, interesting locations. And uh, he just gorilla, uh, he goes by numbers. He just throws them out there. And then six months later, half of them are stolen. You know, some of them have been uh, vandalized. Um, but then he gets some amazing images. And you can really see this guy take it to, uh, I mean, this is just pinhole camera, okay? Pinhole camera, but some of these guys are going bananas. This is a called an analma, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, also known as the Sunny Eights. 
Now this is uh, this is our same Polish friend. The pinhole camera was made out of 35 millimeter fan, uh, film canister, 2,525 images, separate exposures, macro glossy photo paper, one year exposure. So he's doing an entire year exposure. He has a special mechanism that at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock and two o'clock, a certain part of the image is exposed. And as the sun moves across the sky, it makes these, if you take a picture every day at the same time, so 365 images, you'll see the summer, you know, as we go across from one side of the earth to the other side of the earth, you'll see the sun make this sunny eight. I couldn't, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this. I was just so impressed. But that's not all. These guys, some people are using these solar cans and they don't just set up one. This is a, uh, what do they call it? Octoluminium something. Eight of them, upward, sidewards, eastward, westward. And this is all the different uh, pictures, all the different views of the solar cam. Upward, sidewards, downward. <laughs> and you can see one of them got messed up. Probably that was facing straight up and uh, got, some, got some water in it. But just fascinating what you can do with a pinhole camera. Not to be outdone, somebody thought, well, I'm gonna take a picture every couple of weeks. <laughs> and they set up this ginormous setup. I mean, I went to Home Depot and I got myself a, you know, a $10 um, little gadget to hold my, my cameras or to hold my, my uh, one can. And I thought I was going nuts. So what happened was uh, somebody would come every month uh, every couple of weeks, they would take a can down and they would they would uh, have have the path going at different lengths and different uh, images. I don't have the final image on this, but just to see the extremes that some people will go. This was a pinhole camera and solography was in the news not too long ago. They call it the world's longest exposure. Eight years of a of a pinhole camera made out of a can set up in a uh, some telescope it was on the side of a building they put it up and forgot about it <laughs> so eight year exposure and you can just see the sun going up and the sun going down re just regular as all get out doesn't go any higher doesn't go any left uh, I just love this image it's eight years world's record holder there it was on the side of a telescope. <laughs> in this case, they got ice all over it. I have the article in front of me and it was Ilford paper that they had used, uh, a special kind of Ilford paper. I don't have my glasses on, I could uh, read more, but, um, oh, here, here it is. Um, eight by 10 photographic paper. And that's what was inside. And uh, you could see the can here ugly as all get out. It was looked like a beer can. <laughs> and, uh, that's what was used to take the world's longest photo exposure, eight years. Just so impressive. So what's next? So you, again, you get two solstices, summer solstice, winter solstice. So I had planned to take, uh, I had worked it out with Dr. Watson He's right across the street, his, uh, his pediatric building from the Smiley Library. And he has a crow's nest overlooking the Smiley Library. And in the wintertime, I was over there and he agreed, oh, this would be great. Let's set this up. Well, springtime came and uh, all the leaves started, <laughs> started budding and you couldn't see the Smiley Library at all. So what was a beautiful view in the wintertime was a lousy view in the springtime. So I, I had to scratch that plan and have then teamed up with the, uh, with the uh, Mission Estencia, the Nature Conservancy and the Mission Estencia on Brooks, uh, Brookdale, Brookside, uh, Brookside Road that turns into Barton. And so I put up, you can see it right here on the side of the building facing the Estencia. So hopefully I'm gonna get a, uh, a nice image with a foreground this time 
something that I can use. So I used a metal epoxy to put it on. Uh, plan A was to put it to the side, but I hadn't accounted for the uh, the slope of the roof, and so that didn't work. And so I, it was still I had I, I had a Plan B in mind, and uh, ended up going with Plan B. And I get home, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and I go, I didn't pull the tab. <laughs> I installed it, didn't pull the tab. So this morning I went over, brought my ladder back up, climbed back up. And I pulled the tab. So right now, as of today, we're starting on our next six months adventure shooting the Estencia. So installed it Sunday, June the 20th, and I will pick it up Tuesday, December 21st. Uh, probably the 20th, Monday the 20th is when I will pick it up. And so I've got my place, I've got my plan, and I've got my can. And so <laughs> we are all set for that and so um, that wraps up you can get your own solar can if you want to experiment with this or you can make your own there's plenty of opportunities there on the internet so that's what i had for you guys tonight uh what questions can i answer Any questions out there? I thought uh, maybe you'd like to see in the winter time, I use the photographer's Emerus, and one of the tools on there is to show you where the summer, uh, where the sunset rises and where it sets. And so you can see the lighter yellow color is on the right and on the left there in the darker orange, that's where it sets. So that's that's the arch, that's the small arch. In the winter time, you can see it goes in the exact opposite direction. And so I'm putting these, I put these two together just so you can see how far uh, the sun is, is moves from winter to summer. It's just, it's this huge ginormous thing. The solar can has about 160 view field of view. And so it can't take pictures of what's behind it, obviously. Uh, but that's exactly what's what's happening is you're trying to take a picture of what's behind it. And that's where uh, that's why it doesn't go all the way to the end. I can't get the, the smooth tapering on that. And so I thought that was a uh, pretty incredible. Um, yeah, place the black label at the end of your solar can. So this light sensitive paper once uh, it's exposed, a chemical reaction happens, and this is where you know different brands of solar paper is happening. The tiny hole is a 0.5 millimeter hole, so it's just a teeny weeny 0.32, uh, you know, F32 stop uh, can, and it's just a hoot and a holler. Somebody, um, yeah, fun project. Uh, Dave Fickey uh, wrote a note, fun project. So uh, any pinhole questions for the expert, Frank, or any solography questions for, uh, for me? Yes, uh, Bruce, um, this is Nick Kohler, and I had a question. I understood with your first solar cam why you pointed it directly between um, Mount San Bernardino and Mount San Jacinto. Yes. What I didn't really understand is why on the next one, you chose to point it due south. Can you explain? Uh, I don't know what you were trying to get. You were still getting a bell-shaped, uh, small arc and a high arc, but I, I, I'm i missing the point about pointing it due south. Well, one, I had never pointed it due south. <laughs> so this is only the second time that I've done it. So I wanted to point it due south so I could get the maximum amount of arch that I could. And so it was also overlooking Loma Linda. So I, I could get the view of Loma Linda I could get the hospital, I could get the hospital view in here. 
and then I could get the maximum amount of arch left to right. So this is 160 uh, field field of view. And so probably um, this is a little bit lower. Uh, this is a the, the arch that I'm showing here is a little bit higher. The, the foreground probably should be a little bit taller. Uh, but I just wanted to find out what would happen if you face south like they recommend. OK, thank you. Yep. So I tilted this one at about 15 degrees, uh, and I got more foreground, more, more sky uh, than last time. But it's still not. I would love to be able to, and I, maybe I have to put the hole in the bottom or the top. Maybe you're at the bottom. I don't know. Uh, but I tilted it, this one about 25 degrees, this next one that's over at the Estencia. So in six months time, I'll let you know what happens. And it's, again, it's just six months is just so long. Um, and you know, you'll keep wondering, did it fall off? Did it, did a bird, you know, if one little bird poop goes on that, uh, on that little tiny hole, you know, six months is shot. You know, you know, you got one, <laughs> I'm trying to do it. If the uh, you know, if somebody takes a baseball bat to it, if somebody finds it, and does so, you know, does some uh, graffiti on it. Who knows what's going to happen to it? <clears throat> so I know what I shot. Don't know what I got. Uh, opening it. This is you know, is me for me. It's as fun as Christmas morning. I applaud your uh, patience. I have not got that much myself. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. It is uh, it is quite something to uh, to wait that long. I've never, yeah. I, again, I, I do a two minute exposure and think it's an eternity. Four minute exposure, think I'm a hero. Uh, but I needed some some low tech to do this high tech thing, and uh, it's old old school. There's no school like the old school, and, uh, and this was the perfect solution for this kind of photography. I had one more question, Bruce. Nick, hit me. Um, I'm trying to imagine what would happen if you uh, were to set this pinhole camera up on one of the equinox periods and take it down on the opposite equinox. What could I expect to see if you did that? Well, equinox is the midpoint, uh, so you would get uh, you would just get half. So if you if you're going, you would just get exactly half. So it would go from the the midpoint. Let me pull up. Uh, let me share the screen again. So let's say the midpoint is. Can you see my mouse is right here? So it would go down to the winter, for example. So if you go half the equinox, it would go down to one and then it would go back up to the other. So it would be exactly half. Or if you were to do the other half, it would go from the midpoint all the way up and then we go all the way back down. So okay. basically you would cover the same area twice and you'd get half the, uh, half the size. Or in this case, okay. it might be you know, better for my composition. I'm still trying to figure out how to get the entire Tire them out uh, at our latitude. Okay, now I understand. Thank you. You got it. Well, I'm going to hit. I uh, stopped recording. I stopped sharing, and uh, I'm going to stop presenting. <laughs> so, thank you very, so much for joining us. Very interesting presentation. I really enjoyed it. Frank, thanks so much for setting me up well. Uh, it's been great partnering with you. I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. And uh, neat stuff. Well done, Bruce. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for the opportunity, Bruce. I really enjoyed it as well. And it's, it's good to see that uh, something old school has a, a newfound use. It sure does. It's it's. Uh, I think every kid should do one of these things. I think they're, you know, I'm ever since shooting the Milky Way, I've become moon aware, and ever since I've been shooting these, I've become sun sun aware. You know, it's like where exactly is the uh, is the sun uh, to to get this exact uh, the exact this lo location or to.
to find it. So it's it's just fascinating. I'd love to be able to do one of those crazy eight things. Uh, I don't know exactly how I would go about doing it. That would be fun uh, fun project. So if, if somebody's a mechanical engineer and can figure out how to take 2,500, you know, 365 images uh, mechanically, that would be a, a fun one. So uh, I guess we can just hang out until uh, till we're done.